So it is my pleasure to introduce today today's speaker, Marta Damusek. She's an assistant professor in the computational geology laboratory in the Polish Geological Institute. She obtained her PhD in the University of Oslo in 2012, where she investigated folding process and fold geometry. Currently, she focuses on the evolution of various tectonic structures within the evaporite series. Uh, Marta has been involved in various projects aiming to understand the role of rheological variations within evaporite sequences on the internal structure and on the overall evolution of salt structures. She is in also involved in research activities related to underground storage in salt caverns. And today she'll present, I'll let her introduce uh, the, the new title and let's see. Marta? Thank you very much. First, I share my screen. Do you see it? Yes. 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 Okay. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for arranging this meeting and giving me the opportunity to present the results uh, that are related with the long-term rheological behavior of evaporite rocks. In this presentation, um, I put together various uh, research uh, results of the three different research projects during which I collaborated with different people. Uh, all of them I listed uh, on my slide and would like to acknowledge. Um, okay, so, Let's start it. Evaporites have mechanical properties uh, that are very different from the clastic rocks. Sedimentary basins that contain evaporites often are often referred to as uh, salt basins. They tend to deform more intensively than basins that do not that lack evaporites. This is mainly due to the presence of rock salts that easily deforms uh, in a wide range of geological conditions. The prime interest of the salt bodies comes from the oil industry, as uh, many of the hydrocarbon traps are found adjacent to the salt structures. More recently, uh, the internal structure of evaporate has evaporate has become a subject of great interest as the cavern, uh, as the cavern located uh, in the salt structures have been gaining in importance uh, underground storage facilities. Better understanding of the rheological properties of evaporite series is, a cru is crucial for better understanding of the mechanics of salt tectonics and the formation of salt structures. This knowledge can facilitate hydrocarbon explorations. Moreover, uh, this is important to correctly evaluate the storage potential of the salt structures. Internal structures are usually poorly visible in various seismic data. Consequently, in the seismic sections, evaporite sequence is presented as a homogeneous body. Moreover, in various analog or numerical models, rheology of highlight uh, is considered as representative for the whole evaporite sequence. Evaporites are in fact strongly heterogeneous. Here I present the examples of lithological profiles in selected salt basins, where the evaporite succession comprises a range of interbedded rocks, uh, such as uh, carbonates, sulfates, and chlorides. Moreover, they can also contain intercalations of uh, sedimentary rocks or igneous rocks. Lithological variation is often associated with the physical and mechanical variation of these rocks. Intensive deformation of such a mechanically layered and sometimes also gravitationally unstable sequence can lead to the formation of complex uh, internal structures. 
Here I presented a few examples of the internal structures from the Kodava salt mine, Oknale Mari salt mine, uh, and also the um, section through the diapir that is outcropping uh, in Iran. Our main goal is to understand the mechanical properties of different evaporite rocks in order to better understand the mechanical behavior of the whole sequence. Laboratory measurements of different evaporite rocks provided us great insight into understanding of the rock uh, mechanical properties. The method focuses on determination of uh, different flow laws that can accurately describe the stress strain rate relationship for individual rocks and also uh, on identification of parameters that can influence this flow law. For example, uh, temperature and water content. This uh, figure shows um, an example of stress strain uh, rate relation for three different rock types, highlight, gypsum, and anhydrite. And from this diagram, we can already see that for a given differential stress, uh, the rate of deformation of highlight could be few orders of magnitude larger as compared to gypsum and anhydrite. Various studies show, that, uh, show the correlation between the flow strength for different evaporite rocks and uh, that bittern rock salt and uh, rock salt uh, are considered to be strongly weaker to carbonites uh, or anhydrite rocks. The viscosity uh, variation, the, the ratio of viscosity uh, between these different rock types can range up to a few orders of magnitude. There's always the question that reminds is of how well the laboratory short-term experiments can predict the rock deformation at the geological scale. In this presentation, I would like to show you the analysis uh, of the structures that develop in the mechanically layered evaporites and how this analysis can help us to interpret the mechanical properties of the naturally deformed rocks. I present three different uh, structures. There's um, the, the finger structures and single layer buckle fold, and also the analysis of multi layer buckle fold. We documented finger structures in the Kodava salt diapir, which is located in the eastern part of the Zechstein basin. The fingers are built of the car carnalite cores, enveloped by a thin halite la layer and they penetrate the overlaying kizerite layer. What is characteristic is that these fingers are locally clustered and uh, they, they form branch uh, structures. Formation of the finger structures probably took place during the early prediapiric stage of the uh, Kodava salt structure formation when the layers were approximately horizontal. Uh, large scale deformation, probably re related with the formation of the diapir, led to the folding and uh, hold, folding of the whole sequence, which led to develop the fan like splay of the fingers that we observe in the mine. The phase between the position and the initiation of the diapiric rise lasted approximately 10 million years. Formation of finger structures um, is related with the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which develops between viscous materials in an inverse density arrangement in the presence of gravity. For the case of two-layer model, three different shapes of the structures have been uh, identified. Thumb structures, mushroom, and bulb. And the, their shape depends strongly 
on the viscosity ratio between the uh, layers. When the viscosity ratio of the lower layer is much higher as compared to the upper layer, then we tend to develop the uh, columnar thumb shapes. In the case when the viscosity ratio between the layers is approximately the same, we develop mushroom shape. Whereas when it is uh, the, uh, the viscosity of upper uh, layer is much higher than the viscosity of the lower layer, then we develop bulb shapes. What is characteristic about the mushroom and bulb shapes that just they uh, develop the thin steam and have the swollen blob uh, on the top. Mushroom shape compared to the bulb shape develops uh, marginal, marginal blobs. This classification is, however, only for the two layers. In order to understand the finger structure formation in the Kodava salt mine, where we observe three layers, we design a numerical model. We constrain the relative layer thickness based on the field observations, and we tested different viscosity ratio uh, values, uh, viscosity values for the layers. And all the values here uh, we normalized. For density relations, we express uh, the density re relation was expressed through the density difference ratio, uh, where densities, uh, density values uh, used in the model were assumed as the densities of the pure carnalite, highlight, and uh, kizarite layer. Here I present the results of uh, 36 models for varying viscosity ratio. Uh, in, in the row, uh, we observe the increase. Uh, when we look in the row, we observe increase uh, of the and viscosity ratio between the lower and the middle layer, whereas in the column we observe the increase in the viscosity ratio between the upper and the middle layer. I will not go through all the cases, but I would like to show you some patterns that we observe. How we can look at it in a more simple way. Uh, if we have a model, we for, for a moment forget about the fact that we have three layers. Um, so we look at the model with two layers uh, scenario and we have, we compare the viscosity of the upper and lower layer. Then in this diagram, we would observe uh, on the diagonal the that viscosity of the upper uh, and lower layer are equal to one. In this case, we would uh, expect to develop uh, mushroom shape like structures. If we go above the diagonal, then we are in the field where the uh, lower layer has a much higher viscosity than the upper layer. And here we tend to develop um, some shape like structures. If we go below the diagonal, here uh, we tend to develop uh, bulk shaped structures. However, we have a three layer models, and this diagram shows the influence of the presence of the, this thin middle layer that we have at the contact. It shows that the mushroom shape develops um, in the diagonal part, but only for the restricted viscosity ratio values. If we look slightly above or slightly below this diagonal, we observe uh, thumb and bulk structures as expected. However, if we go much farther from the diagonal, so we increase viscosity of one layer, then we tend to develop slightly different structures. And in this case, we increase viscosity only of one layer. And for in this case, uh, we promote more intensive deformation between two other layers. So in this model, 
we have very high viscosity of the lower layer, whereas much smaller viscosities of the middle and top layer. In this case, we have um, high viscosity of the upper layer and uh, small, uh, smaller viscosities uh, of the middle and lower layer. So if we try to interpret the finger structures from the Kodava salt mine, uh, here I highlighted only the models where we observe the finger shaped structures. The results show that uh, if we have a higher viscosities of the upper and lower layers, we tend to develop folds that have very pronounced shape, but they develop um, away from each other. Whereas when we use smaller viscosities of the upper or lower layer, then we tend to uh, obtain the cluster forms. Uh, through the comparison of the field data and our numerical results, we estimate that the viscosity ratio between the uh, lower and the middle layer was on the order of 10 to minus one, whereas between the upper and middle layer on the order of 10 to minus three. Having the constraint that our deformation could last no longer than 10 million years, we um, speculate that the viscosities of the, the effective viscosities of the lower layer was smaller than 10 to minus 17. Pascal seconds, uh, middle layer was above 10 to 17 Pascal seconds, whereas uh, the viscosity of the top layer was below 10 to minus 16 Pascal seconds. The, num uh, the numerical results in the, uh, indicate the viscosity variation on the range of two to maybe three orders of magnitude. However, when we look in the field, our field data, when we look closer, we notice that the layers that we model are not pure carnalite, highlight, and kieserite layers. We observe the white spots of kieserite within the carnalite layers, and also we observe the red spots probably of carnalite uh, that, uh, are, that are found within uh, kieserite layers. So this means that the obtained values are not characteristic for the pure uh, monomineralic layers, but more for these polymineralic layers where the car carnalite, highlight, and kieserite uh, minerals are dominated in individual layers. The fact that the layers do not represent uh, the pure highlight, kieserite, and carnalite layer might affect our uh, numerical results. And because we have a different uh, density difference ratio, and we use numerical results, uh, numerical models to test the role of different density difference uh, ratio. We carry out additional simulation to test the role of uh, this uh, parameter. Um, we tested four different density different ratios and plot our results in uh, one plot. But uh, in order to visualize, visualize it and easily compare the results, I show only the shape of the middle layer. And we see. Uh, from, from these results that uh, small variation of the density uh, of individual layer does not uh, impact the general shape of our, our structures. This also uh, shows that viscosity is the first or viscosity ratio between this layer is the first order parameter that controls the shape of uh, forming finger structures. Now I'd like to move to the, another example, uh, uh, which is uh, buckle folds. We found nice examples of single layer fold train uh, in the core of uh, Vindam 
salt pillow, uh, in, uh, which, which is located in the central part of the Zechstein Basin. The rock consists of mainly of highlight with intercalation of uh, thin sulfate uh, layers. The layer is around one to uh, 20 millimeters thick. Um, the picture here shows um, an example of folded polyhylite layer embedded in the rock salt. How the viscosity ratio influenced the single layer fold shape? These uh, three pictures show an example of the fold geometry that is uh, developed after 50% of shortening for three different viscosity ratio between the middle, between the layer and uh, the matrix. And in this case, uh, I use viscosity ratio equal to 10, 25, and 100. And what we see that with increasing viscosity ratio, we observe development uh, of more pronounced uh, faults with larger amplitudes and larger wavelengths. For the case of small, uh, viscosity ratio, we observe that the layer uh, subjects quite substantial uh, thickening. How to interpret a viscosity ratio from such a fold shape? For the case of a single layer fold and large amplitude fold, we have uh, basically two methods that are commonly employed. The first one is developed by Fletcher and Sherwin, whereas the second is uh, developed by Schmaholz in Podlachico. In both of these methods, we need to measure four basic uh, fault shape parameters, such as arc length, wavelength, amplitude, and thickness. For that, we use a fold geometry toolbox and this is an open source tool that allows for a quick digitization and analysis of these uh, required parameters. Using that, we obtain the viscosity ratio uh, that uh, ranges between uh, 15 and uh, 35. However, if we look at the folds under optical microscope and also under the scanning electron microscope, we observe that the layer is not homogeneous. Instead, we commonly observe that the polyhylite layer comprises uh, halite grains of variable size. The estimated viscosity ratio in, in this case would be the viscosity ratio between the polymineral layer composed of polyhylite uh, and highlight and uh, uh, highlight halite matrix. In other thin sections, we also observe that uh, polyhylite layers are embedded in the halite matrix, where we can distinguish layers uh, of highlight with different grain size. The transitions between the grain size is sometimes uh, sharp, whereas uh, in other cases, we observe the gradual change in the grain sizes. We know that the grain size is one of the parameters that influences the effective uh, properties of the rocks. Thus, uh, in the analysis of such uh, rocks, we cannot use uh, the tool the method that I showed you before. We should think about such layers, uh, such um, rocks as multi-layer rocks. And unfortunately, we don't have any direct methods of estimating viscosity ratio between the layers. Coming to multi-layer folding, I would like to show you uh, example of um, multi-layer fold interpretation, but from a different uh, place. Uh, from Ocnele Mari salt mine, which is uh, located in Romania, in the Romanian Southern Carpathians. Rock salt in Ocnele Mari salt mine is characterized with a high purity. The 
rock salt contains over 90% of highlight. However, distinct uh, layering that you can observe is caused by variation in the impurity contents. Microstructural analysis allow us to find that the dark layers are composed mainly uh, of uh, halite with clay minerals and anhydrite. The fault patterns that we observe at various scales clearly indicate that uh, during the folding, the sequence was mechanically stratified. The dark layers contain more impurities and the, these layers are characterized with more regular thickness compared to the bright layers. And for that reason, we infer that uh, these layers have higher viscosities. During our work, uh, we aim to investigate this role of impurities and to quantify the role of impurities on the effective uh, viscosity of uh, rock salt. The structures in the mine can be on, observed on a clean surface of pillars, wall, wall and ceiling, allowing for detailed analysis. We um, have over 50 regularly arranged pillars in the mine. Uh, we employ for, uh, photogrammetry techniques to reconstruct the analysis of the shaped structures. Example of such a reconstruction of one of the pillar you can see in this video. Faults are the most impressive structures in Oknelemari salt mine. The fault axes are nearly horizontal and are oriented almost east-west. The section perpendicular through the fold axis can be directly observed in most of east or west facing pillar walls. High resolution of the digital photos and the numerical models allow us to construct the north-south uh, section through the mine. The largest scale fold can be observed at the mine scale uh, and they have wavelength of around uh, 40 meters. Excellent exposures of smaller scale folds can be observed on uh, one of the pillar, which I presented uh, here. For convenience, I rotated the image. So the actual plane of large scale folds is uh, vertical. The presented sequence exhibits uh, multiple orders of folding. I marked here with uh, dark uh, lines, the fault interfaces that illustrate faults that develop in different scales. The lowest line marks the fault with wavelengths of around one and a half meter. The middle sequence uh, develops faults with a wavelength around 15 centimeters. And the highest, uh, the highest layer uh, shows um, layers with um, wavelength around three centimeters. We refer to the folds that develop uh, in various scales as polyharmonic folds. The presence of polyharmonic folds is an evidence of the mechanical stratification. Uh, in the study, we asked, we want to learn, uh, we want to investigate what is the viscosity ratio between these layers. But before going that, let's look at the role of viscosity ratio on the shape of developing folds in the multi-layer multi sequence. The presented examples illustrate how the fold shape changes uh, with increasing viscosity ratio for a given initial uh, multi-layer package. Generally, when we increase the viscosity ratio, this leads to development of more pronounced faults. However, if we look at the faults uh, uh, in different layers, we observe that these layers, uh, have, these faults, they, have, they, can, they can have different geometry. 
it is because the geometry depends also on the neighboring layer. So let's look closer to the all possible scenarios of the multi-layer folding. In the first case, we have the layer that locates uh, far away from the other layers. We develop single layer folds with a characteristic wavelength. In case when we have layers of equal thickness and they are close to each other, we develop the uh, harmonic folding. Here we develop characteristic wavelength, but this wavelength is different from the wavelength that develops in the case of single layer fold. In the case when we have a multi-layer package, but uh, we have uh, layers with different thickness, we can have two possible scenarios. The first one is uh, when the layers are far away from each other, we, de we develop two different wavelengths, but the wavelength to thickness uh, ratio of each layer, it corresponds to the uh, single layer fold. Uh, however, when the layers are uh, closer to each other, they start to interact. We develop uh, wavelengths in each fold that are different from the case of harmonic folding and also for the single, uh, single uh, layer folding. If we get closer, uh, if these uh, layers get closer to each other, they start to effectively behave as a single layer. So to summarize, to summarize, the development of polyharmonic folds is limited to the specific combination of geometrical and rheological parameters of the multi-layer sequence. The layers need to be close to each other to interact with each other. However, they cannot be not, uh, they cannot be uh, too close to each other, so they don't behave effectively as a single layer. This optimum distance between these layers is a, um, is a function of viscosity ratio. In order to investigate viscosity ratio between the layers, uh, we design a, a numerical model. We constrain the initial model geometry from the field observation and we tested different viscosity ratio uh, to find the optimum range of uh, values. Um, we used, for that, we use uh, Folder, an open source software, which is designed for the analysis of deformation in the layered medium. We subject uh, our model to up to 90% of uh, shortening. The deformation structure uh, that, that is obtained after 90% of shortening is, uh, does not correspond to the structures observed in the field. We, need, we needed additional parameter to constrain the amount of shortening. And for that, we decided to use the mean limb dip of the large scale folds which in the field is around 45 degrees. And here I present the result of our simulation for different viscosity ratios. And the amount of shortening uh, is different in each model. This is because of the fact that um, small, uh, the, the models with the small viscosity ratio need more shortening to reach this uh, required uh, limb diff of uh, 45 degrees. And for this reason, for example, in, in the model with viscosity ratio equal eight, we need to shorten it by 85%, whereas in the model with viscosity ratio of 50, to shorten our model only uh, 46%. Only in the models with a viscosity ratio, which is uh, smaller than 30, we observe um, polyharmonic folds. For models uh, which are smaller than 10, we 
do not observe um, three orders of faults that develop. Um, detailed analysis of uh, the field and uh, numerical structures show us the best correspondence uh, that occurs for the model where we have a viscosity um, equal, viscosity ratio equal 15. To conclude, uh, I show you the analysis of three different natural tectonic structures that develop in evaporite rocks. The structures uh, develop in layered uh, polymineralic um, rocks. We estimate that the effective viscosity ratio between these rocks can vary on the order up to uh, three orders of magnitude. Um, how, well, how to look at it uh, in the broad, in the, look at it in a little bit broader. In order to uh, understand the mechanics of salt tectonics, we need to understand the rock behavior at different scales. On one hand, we already have a lot of um, laboratory measurements that provided great insight into our understanding of the rock mechanics. On the other hand, we have a number of data that are related with the large scale deformation that comes from the various uh, reconstructions. We do have this gap. In order to have a full understanding of the mechanics um, of salt tectonics, we need to gradually build our knowledge, starting from the small scale analysis and learn how to upscale our data. The big challenge is the fact that uh, for the case of strongly mechanically layered rocks, we tend to develop structures which also evolve in time. So the formation and evolution of this structure can impact the overall behavior of this uh, of the sequence. In the presented study today, I show you the result, which is a little step forward in building our knowledge about the mechanical properties of naturally deformed evaporite rocks. There's still lots of work to be done, and presently. Um, a new project called uh, Polaris has started, which I take part in. And the main goal of this project is to understand how we can approximate the mechanical behavior of layered systems. And the results would be highly relevant for the salt tectonics. And I hope to tell you more about uh, in the near future. And for the moment, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this brilliant presentation, Marta. It was great and um, having your talk. Um, are you um, available for a um, um, few minutes of questions? And then, yeah, if you're happy to proceed with questions. So anyone who would like to ask a question, please can type in the Q&A session, section or in the chat. Um, but I will start I'm reading some of the questions in our Q&A section. So first from Bruna Tavares, um, how it was stratified mechanically? By mechanical stratification, I mean uh, the, the layers that have different mechanical properties. But I guess this question refers to a specific picture or a specific part of the talk, and I'm not sure uh, what it refers to. Yeah, I think so. Um, Bruna, if you would like to um, specify further your question, then feel free. Um, thanks, Marta. And we also have a question from Carlos Giardo. 
Um, great presentation, Martha. Can you elaborate more about the halite grain size? Well, we we do observe that uh, the grain size uh, differs. Uh, this is, I guess, related to the picture from from uh, that are related with the single layer folds. Um, we observe uh, that very close to the to the layer, we have uh, a highlight highlight uh, grain size. They are more much different uh, than when we go farther away. What is the reason of uh, this uh, variation? This is this reminds uh, the question we for the moment. Uh, I don't know what was the reason for that. Uh, it could be also related to, with uh, rec uh, later recrystallization. But when we observe these uh, structures in the field, uh, we actually decided not to uh, take any interpretation of these, um, these structures as uh, we don't know what is basically when this um, um, this grain size uh, is related to, so if we don't have any recrystallization. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, about previous question from Bruna, she says she refers to the first picture before video in the question that she asked about the how it was stratified mechanically. Mm. Okay. Yeah, first picture before the video. So this is the picture about uh, uh, from the Oknelamari salt mine, and uh, here we have uh, different layers of the white salt that is uh, um, basically um, impure. Uh, very very pure layers of halite, and then next to them we have uh, layers that are dark, and uh, they have um, they they are uh, impure. And what we observe when we look at these layers uh, that they have different uh, thickness. Uh, the 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 the, the, mm, the thickness. Uh, along the layer varies strongly for the case of um, uh, these whitish layers. And this is a very, uh, the, the thickness remains constant, uh, more or less for the case of these dark layers. And uh, this is a great suggestion for us that when we observe these uh, folded structures that we have this mechanical uh, variation. Great, thanks. And um, now from Bruno Kokombet, um, he says, great work. Um, any way to image the internal um, structures of a dome without having a mine in it? Mm. Uh, well, there are possible uh, there are possibilities to image the dome structure, but uh, using seismics. Uh, but seismic data, they are in getting increasingly better, and they allow us to really look better into the dome. But uh, yeah, having mind, this is the best way to to actually see and look at these structures. But uh, I guess. Uh, in the future, we find a way how we can better visualize these uh, complex structures. But yeah, having minds is uh, the best way to actually look uh, inside the salt domes. I think it's really great to see it all in 3D. <laughs> yeah. um, also, oh, hi, B. Chima says, great work. Um, thank you. And now a question and from Frank Bill. He says, beautiful geology. 
looks like metamorphic rock structure. I have looked at seismic images of large scale structures within salt nuts in the Gulf of Mexico. And these also look like fold nuts in the internal zones of the Alps. Do you see larger scale folding within the salt? Yes, we do see the larger scale folds, but they are not really well constrained. And so uh, we, uh, in various domes, it is so difficult to find uh, the details. So in order to build the numerical model to really understand uh, what's behind, how it's built, we need to have a lot of uh, detailed data. So what I think that when we go in the outcrop, when we look at this uh, outcrop scale, this gives us the really good control of what we see and uh, what we have there. For the larger scale, we do see a lot of large scale faults, but for the moment, I think this is uh, difficult to interpret. And uh, yeah, but I, I think that, uh, well, for some cases, it would be interesting actually to, to maybe uh, try a little bit larger structure to, to, uh, to analyze. Thanks, Martha. Um, also a question from Mahdi. Mahdi, thanks for the nice presentation. Um, have you done sensitivity analysis also for thickness of the layer? Uh, yes, we did a lot of, uh, in all the models, I didn't present all these details, but in most of the cases we do detailed analysis and sensitivity analysis for the thickness of the layers and uh, some initial perturbation of the layers and so on. All of them are presented uh, in, in the papers that are uh, published. Great. And thanks. Um, so, Marta, we still have some questions now in the chat. Um, are you happy to go for a few more questions? Um, we can we can read those for you if you're still happy to answer those. If not, we can email them to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, as would you like to go for the chat questions, or should I keep going with these ones? We can we can go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, from Simon Gonzalez, I am wondering if salt rocks are more like to metamorphed rocks than sedimentary rocks, based on behavior and deformation styles. Examples of of deformation and behavior of density and viscosity are very similar to the analysis than in metamorphic rocks. Yeah, it's, it's more a comment than a question. Yeah, these are in various way, uh, they are very um, similar. And the, the thing, so it, for example, in when it comes to faults, it doesn't matter if the faults develop in the sedimentary rocks or metamorphic rocks, the parameter that basically governs the structure formation is the viscosity ratio uh, between the layer and the embedding uh, matrix. So you can develop similar looking like faults uh, also in metamorphic rocks and uh, other rock types. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Another one from Gonzalo Calvo. Are the fingers polymer in, in three dimensions? Are there other verticalized 3D morphologies besides the, the three dimensions? And thanks and congratulations, uh, it, This uh, The place where we found this uh, fantastic uh, finger structures uh, were not very well um, accessed. Well, we have evidence that they are really three-dimensional morphologies, but uh, uh, well, it is. It, we couldn't find it uh, a nice example to actually show it. But uh, for different sections, we, we can observe in, in the walls and uh, also in the ceiling. 
that they are really nice uh, three sectional three, 3D sections. For example, in the ceiling, we also observe these uh, circular uh, shapes that actually show the section uh, through the through the fingers. So yeah, we, we are I think we are sure that these are three dimensional structures. Great, thanks. And um, also from Amna Hussein Omar, uh, thank you so much for the informative presentation. How the differential pressure works on this type of structures? Mm -hmm. um, how does differential pressure works on this type of structure? Well, any parameter that actually uh, influences the effective properties of the rock uh, would influence at the end the structure formation. If the pressure leads to the strengthening, softening, or development of different um, deformation or, uh, mechanics, it would definitely uh, influence uh, the structure formation. So yes, it could. Probably it would also depend on the rock type and the amount of change that you expect. Thanks. Um, we have one more from um, Hiad Ahmad. Uh, thanks for your clear speech. I heard that diapers could turn over while pulling. Is that true um, for what you've seen on your work? The diapers yes. turn over. Turn over um, while pulling up. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if he means sorry, um, a lock to know, so yeah. Turn over. Um, I'm not sure if uh, if I understand. What do you mean by turn over? Yeah. Um, yeah, that might could maybe. Um, Give us some more, yeah. If you give some more, on your, yeah. Yeah, some more details on on your question. Yeah, we are not exactly sure if you mean an alloxin of salt or which specific structure you mean. And so let's go to the next one. Willie Gill, um, great presentation and research. Thank you so much, Marta. Um, lots of people saying nice presentation. Thanks. And then one more question. Elena Konstantinovka, um, are there any elements of late brittle deformation that can be observed in salt in the mine? Yes, there are many uh, brittle structures that we also observe in the mine. And they are uh, characteristic for uh, different uh, rock types. Uh, so, Regarding this, uh, so in this presentation, I would like to give you an overview of this uh, ductile structures. Uh, this is because uh, we have tools uh, to analyze it, and so we these tools uh, allow us to um, invest to, to to say something about the viscosity ratio between different rocks. Brittle structures uh, are more tricky to analyze. Uh, they are informative for different processes, uh, but uh, yeah, we do observe it, but we didn't consider it uh, in this um, uh, in the studies. And one from Sedin Chakir. Um, what is the impact of burrow and increase of temperature on salt masses? Uh, or also in the this impact of um, burn death on the outcome shape. So what it basically influences uh, is the temperature, and temperature is one of these parameters that uh, strongly influences the effective uh, properties of the rocks. So uh, we expect that um, the the structures would behave more ductile. Uh, and obviously, when we compare two different rock types, and at a given temperature, the viscosity ratio between two rocks can have some specific values. 
whereas when we increase the temperature, the, the increase in viscosity of each rock might be different. So at the end, when we compare uh, the same structure, development of the same structure, but at different temperature, the viscosity ratio between the rocks can be different. So temperature is, uh, is, uh, has is a parameter that strongly influences the, the effective properties of the rock, yes. Thanks, Martha. Um, again, from Anna oh, no, Hussein Omer, can you explain the stratigraphic model? Can we find stacking patterns and, and group them into a power sequence set? Stacking patterns. Uh, Maybe you um, refer to the layering within the the I mean, the, this fingering pattern, that uh, stacking pattern. Um, I'm not sure if I correctly understand this question. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more here? It would be easier for me to answer the question. Yes, yes. So let's move to the next one and then we may come back to this one later. Um, from Albert Ma Mahend, might you have some thoughts on whether any of these different types of salt might be more enriched in lithium than, uh, than the others? Well, no, I don't have any knowledge about it. Um, sorry, we, we, did, uh, we did more uh, of the structural work rather than this, uh, some very specific uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know about it. Thanks, Martha. And um, from Mahadi, um, thanks for the nice presentation. Have you done? Ah, OK, that, that, that one about we you answered the red uh, about sensitivity analysis. Um, from Sofiani Vizajar, which software did you use? Are they freeware? Uh, for the modeling, I use uh, the open source uh, software, which is called Folder, and it's based on the Milamine. Uh, all of them, they're available online. There are papers, companion papers with the softwares. Um, also for the fold shape analysis, I use another software, which is called Fold Geometry Toolbox, which is also an open source uh, software. And both of these softwares, uh, these are the softwares that we actually develop and uh, put it online. So yeah, they can be used. Thanks, Martha. Um, one question from Juan Soto. Um, nice presentation, Martha. Thanks. Um, his question is How do we explain the asymmetric shape of the folds? Your models always reproduce vertical folds, which differ from the observed geometry. Uh, you mean this uh, asymmetric folds that uh, we observe in the large scale? Uh, we have. Uh, this is very difficult actually to develop this asymmetry of the folds, uh, buckle layer folds. And uh, the shearing is not really the good in indicator to, uh, not really good um, parameter that uh, leads to the development of asymmetric folds. Uh, many um, people has, have actually analyze it and try to develop different um, setups and try to develop the asymmetric folds. The best way to develop asymmetry in the folds is, for example, to have um, um, some disturbance in the, in the base of the salt. So once when you, when you move the salt, when you shorten it, but you have some ramp or some variation in the base, this is actually the best way you can develop 
the asymmetry of the, this large scale fault that we actually observed in, for example, in Ocnel Mari salt mine. This, uh, there, there are many uh, numerical simulations uh, that actually this problem is dedicated. And we also think that this could be the case why, uh, why we do observe this large scale asymmetry in fault in, for example, Ocnel Mari salt mine. Martha, um, we have a question from Pedro Barreto. Excellent presentation, many thanks. Very interesting assessment on the formation of different vaporites and with different degrees of impurity, geology, um, and relation with different deposits. Did you manage to study the formation on major layers of sedimentary rocks, such as siltstone, sandstone, shales, and limestones, as in stringers? Um, Oman, for example, or even basalt dikes interbedded in evaporitic sequence. And, and also, have you used this sort of data of more rigid units to calculate internal rate of deformation? We didn't make any systematic study. Uh, systematic analysis to actually quantify the role of impurities and the role, uh, the role in the effective viscosity. So this is, uh, this is a project we hopefully start very soon and we would like to quantify. So how do you transfer, how do you correlate the amount of impurities in rock salt on the effective uh, um, viscosity of the rock. But we don't have for the moment uh, enough uh, field data to actually constrain that. Um, but this is an interesting question and we hopefully start working on that. Um, the second question, did you manage to study the formation on major layers on sedimentary rocks? Um, for the moment, I actually focus on the analysis of uh, in the small scale. And uh, here I presented only the results uh, for the um, evaporite rocks, but other sedimentary rocks and also metamorphic rocks, and then try to interpret different uh, viscosity ratios between the different rock types based on particularly fault shapes. Uh, yes, I did analyze them, um, but I haven't found such a faults in the evaporite sequence, the good examples that can be actually nicely quantified. So, um, we, we haven't, uh, and the third question, have you, you use this sort of data of more rigid units to calculate internal rate of deformation. No, we didn't do that yet. But uh, yeah, this would be interesting actually to look at, yeah. All right, thank you. Awesome. Uh, um, again, from Elena Kostnikovska, um, thank you very much for a great presentation. Then Gonzalo Calvo asks, is it safe to use caverns into evaporite as a reservoir, particularly on the long term? Uh, well, it, it obviously depends on the, the salt structure, but we already have some caverns with, uh, within uh, salt structures. Uh, various numerical simulation assures us, and then various uh, people that actually work on these projects, they, uh, they think it's uh, safe. Uh, it's good for us um, to, to actually use this type of storage. Um, well, I, I think it is uh, it, it is safe. Uh, we should we should actually go for it and um, explore different rock salts, different structures, and uh, um, Obviously, assure that make sure that each that the structure where we aim to uh, to develop such a cavern is uh, safe enough. But uh, in general, I don't see the main issue with it. 
Thank you. Um, um, again, friend Steele asked if you could please spell the name of the software. He he did not um, hear the name clearly. Or maybe if you could easier, maybe if you could type then. Okay, I can. Yeah, I can type. This is a folder. Um, software domains, the software for the default shape analysis or the analysis of the, sorry, for the uh, analysis of the structures uh, in the layered medium folder. I can type it. Thanks very much, Martha. Um, also, um, People, thanks. Thank you for your replies. Um, yeah, I think I've, we've gone from all the questions so far. Um, so if anyone, it's the right, um, uh, six past three p.m. So if anyone else would like to send more questions, you can send through our AAPG South Bay email. We could forward to Martha. And I would like to, on behalf of the APG Technical Interest Group, to thank you again, Martha, for this great presentation. Very informative, very interesting. And thanks, everyone, um, for attending. It was such um, a great talk. Thank you very much, Elsa. Thanks, Martha. Thank you very much for an awesome talk. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.